So when I was asked to um, come and speak here today, um, I got in touch with some of you, the members and what do you want me to talk about? So it's going to be a little bit the opposite of what Don just talked about and we're going to kind of meet in the middle a little bit. So landscape design using native plants. So what is considered native vegetation? It is the species that were here before European settlement. Uh, diverse and successional. Do we know what successional means? Okay, we're going to talk about that too later. Uh, natural selection, it's been around for 10,000 years. Uh, hardy and perennial to the ecoregion, but co-evolved with our native wildlife. And I'll get into that in a little bit too. Why native plant communities? They require little to no additional irrigation once established require no fertilizers. If you fertilize native plants, you're encouraging weed growth. Uh, very few pesticides, uh, restores wildlife habitat, and aesthetically pleasing and beautiful. Okay, what do we mean by successional? Process of change, back up, change in the species structure of an ecological community over time. I call these native plant communities. They want to be with their friends, diversity, high species counts, 50, 75, and more. Uh, over time, they are not going to stay the same. You're not going to go out and weed a prairie so that it always looks year after year after year. You can call it evolution. We call it succession. It is going to change with time. These species have evolved that way, and it's in their genetics. If you ever meet and have a chance to see Dr. Doug Ptolemy speak, um, we end up speaking at a lot of the same con uh, conferences. He is an entomologist from the University of Delaware. His big concept in, if you read his book, Bringing Nature Home, is that our native plants co-evolved with the native wildlife. That means our insects, our birds, our other wildlife, they depend on each other. You take away the native plant habitats, we are going to start to say goodbye to our native wildlife. Native plants can tolerate or resist most native, native diseases, okay? So you bring uh, emerald ash borers over from Asia, they have no local or native um, pests or anything to keep them in control. So they explode, they find something they're happy with and that's green ash and I think silver bells they've been finding their way to and there's nothing to keep them in check whereas you uh, put a native uh, disease vector or an insect on a native plant it needs that plant it's not going to overcome it and totally kill a plant biodiversity creates an ecosystem that survives and thrives over millennia has anybody ever here seen Dr. Ptolemy talk Okay, just a few. I, he always asked the question, let's pick Japanese red leaf maple. That was one of Don's just real explosive plants. How many species of native wildlife do you think that Japanese red leaf maple supports? Zero. Now, Quercus rubra, one of my favorites, red oak. How many species? 500. Just think of what you're putting into the environment just by planting native species. Native vegetation and water quality. I give bits and pieces of this presentation to a lot of different groups, uh, but native vegetation, we have done kind of touched on wet sites, but I work a lot with shorelines. It's very important. Uh, you were talking, asking about, I was the guy that raised my hand on Wisconsin waterways and lakes. As a matter of fact, I speak at different lake conferences. Cleans up the water quality. It traps and holds sediments. Two, it sequesters not only excess nutrients from <coughs> turf grass, but also from leaf litter flowing towards the lake, and also pollutants. The big thing down here on the bottom, 80 to 90 percent of all lake life happens in the riparian area. Is that a term you use often? Yes where the land and the water meet, riparian. So think nesting, think food, think little ducks growing up, little fish hatching and spawning. That happens in the riparian area. 
Rain infiltration, this is the one the engineers, I get them to perk up on. Turf grass, typical infiltration rate, maybe a third of an inch per hour. In the 70s and 80s, I don't know how many of these detention basins we did with turf grass. If the rain goes there and sits a while, so what? Okay, native vegetation, seven and a half, eight inches per hour. Now the other thing is active transpiration, that once the root systems start taking up excess rainwater, it's gonna come back into the atmosphere and actually recharge atmospheric oxygen through that vegetation. Now the other thing it does, it holds a lot of excess rainwater on the vegetation. So some bioswales and rain gardens are gonna very, be very short statured plants, some are gonna be very tall. So you have a lot of options if you're getting, trying to get rid of excess rainwater. Okay, are we all familiar with the USDA plant hardiness map? Okay, for now, set it aside. Uh, we deal with the herbaceous natives that we work with, the EPA ecoregions. And the EPA, in their different wisdom, has several different levels. Okay, level one, it's by geography, the west coast, the Rocky Mountains, the Great Plains, the southern states, the Great Lakes, and the eastern forests. That's the easy one. As you can see, you get higher, it gets much more complex. When you get to level four, it looks like a mosaic or a jigsaw puzzle. It's supposed to be how the genetics of plants evolved over time. I have yet to find a bee or a pollinator or a bird that can read a map and stay within these little painted areas. So when people ask us, our ecoregions, is plant sourcing really important? We don't know. Agricol has participated in studies where we have taken the DNA from Black-Eyed Susan in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, and Texas, and there's no difference. We don't know. Nobody's really tested if it is super important. Some ecologists will actually ask us, we want three or four different ecotypes. At Agricol, when we grow plants, genus, species, and where we got the seed from. All of our seed sources are certified to the location. We know where it came from, the remnant prairies. We probably have six different ecotypes of black-eyed Susan that we grow. But when somebody says, I've got to have uh, black-eyed Susan grown within 50 miles of Cook County, Illinois, we can do that. But if then they say, well, we need it from Columbus, Ohio, we can do that. Or if they need St. Louis, Missouri, we can do that too. If you learn one thing today, I'd like you to learn and retain ecosystem or environmental or ecological services. Supporting, provisioning, regulating, and culturing. These are the things we get back from our environments. Have you heard this term before? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I got somebody here that's on the ball. Okay, <laughs> supporting services, evolution, air and soil formation. This is the physics 101 of our environment. This puts our environment into motion. Provisioning services, these are all the tangible things we get, fresh water, food and protein, fuel. Now, I use this little drawing because it's going up. As our population is growing every day by how many thousand people, the demand on our environment for ecosystem services is always ascending. Unfortunately, our earth and our environment, its ability to supply those and replenish is descending. What happens when those two lines cross? I've got a son that lives out in Southern California. They've he moved out there three years ago. They've been dealing with water rationing ever since he got out there. It's just second nature now. We as landscape architects have the power, we have the knowledge, the experience, and the skill to either restore, replenish, but also get our ecosystems to get that curve going back up again of available ecosystem services. Regulating. This is all the things that keep our uh, ecosystem in harmony with each other. Climate moderation. I don't care if you do or don't believe in climate change or, uh, anyway, climate moderation. If you believe in cli uh, climate change and global warming, 
when I fly into O'Hare to take a connecting flight somewhere, you go af over acre after acre after acre of green roof and blacktop. Why can't that be green roofs? Why can't it be permeable and pervious pavements? It would cool down our cities. It would recharge our groundwater and it would put more atmospheric oxygen back into the air. Cultural services, these are the non-material benefits. If you have ever heard of an architect from Wisconsin, he did a little stop over here in Chicago named of Frank Lloyd Wright. He was a master of biophilic design. If you work in a cube farm where you're segregated from views outside, from green things, and from fresh air, you are not as happy, you are not as healthy, and you're not as productive. Now, if you are exposed to the great outdoors and you have some green plants, you are happier, healthier, and more productive. These are the cognitive things we get from our environments. Non-sustainable landscapes, pretty common to us. Toxic fertilizers, excessive pesticides. Um, last week I was in Peoria, here nurseries, and I got it. Can you drink the well water here? What do you think their answer was? You can't. Nitrates from ag practices. It builds up in our well water. That's what we're doing to our environment. We got it turn things around. Sustainable landscapes are a balance between the inputs and what we get back. Let's keep it on the ecosystem services side. Okay, three basic considerations of a sustainable design. The aesthetics, the environmental benefits, and what does it take to manage that landscape? We do a sustainability audit. And Don went through most of those things already, everything we look at before we start planning a landscape. But plant communities, do we have native species and do they belong on that site? Do we have ornamentals? Do we have invasives? Or do we have exotics? Will all these plants on the site play nice with each other? Let's talk invasives. They don't play nice with the native species. They tend to dominate, why? No natural controls or limiting factors present. They're opportunistic. Think of these Asian carps sw swimming up the Chicago River. They can deplete resources. Sometimes I've got slides in here with kudzu. If you ever bend down south and see what kudzu does, take uh, garlic mustard, buckthorn, and everything else, throw them together, you got kudzu. They can outcompete for resources, and they're hard to get rid of. But the biggest thing is they bring in their pests with them.